Uh, in this session, we are going to talk about uh, data warehousing best practices using Amazon Redshift. Uh, so quickly, I want to go over what Amazon Redshift's history was and development, uh, get into cluster architectures, talk about some concepts and terminologies, do some storage deep dive, and then I want to talk about what are the new features that we launched over the last six months. Uh, there were some significant features that we launched over the last six months, and also what is coming in the pipeline. So, history and development. Those of you who are using Redshift today, how many of you are using Redshift today? Okay, not many. So what we did is we took a very familiar database, PostgreSQL, and packaged that with OLAP, MPP, and Columnar, added all the dependent AWS services to it, like KMS, VPCs, Route 53 into it, and gave you a package of Redshift. So Amazon Redshift is a collection of all these services for you. It is not Postgres in itself. It exposes something like Postgres. It's MPP, Columnar, OLAP as well. Since launch, we launched it in Valentine's Day 2013. Uh, since launch, we have fallen in love with it, been one of our fastest growing services in the AWS ecosystem. Uh, we have introduced 100 significant patches to Redshift and 150 significant features since that time. Each of these patches are automated. You don't have to take downtime for installing the patches. We automatically install the patches during maintenance windows for you. We upgrade your cluster. We keep putting in smaller patches, optimizer fixes as we go about doing it. So let us look at a cluster architecture. Let us dive deep into how the cluster works and what it looks like. The cluster is split into two pieces. One is the leader node and the others are the compute nodes. There are one or more compute nodes attached to a leader node. The leader node is the SQL endpoint, so your Tableau servers, your, your, your Attinuity workbench, all these guys connect into the Redshift leader node. And then the compute nodes is where the, all your data is stored. So going a bit more deeper into the components of the leader and compute nodes, your leader node actually does parsing and execution of your queries. So as soon as a query is submitted to your leader node, the leader node converts that into a C++ code and pushes it down to the compute nodes for it to execute. The leader node also exposes PG catalog tables. If you're familiar with Postgres, this will be very familiar to you. PostgreSQL exposes PG catalog tables to understand the inner workings of Postgres, and we do the same thing on the leader node. On the compute node, there is query execution processing engine happening. You have backup and restore process happening. All backups happen directly out into S3. We continuously backup data into S3 for you. There is replication process that happens between the compute nodes. I'll talk about it in a bit. We also have local storage attached to the compute node, which contains your disks, your slices, tables, columns, and blocks. In this talk, we're going to go deep into these aspects. So a few concepts and terminologies before we get into the storage nodes, blocks, slices. So Redshift has been designed to reduce I.O. Uh, I.O. in a database is your biggest concern for performance. If you can reduce your I.O., you are more performant. For starters, Redshift is columnar storage. When you access your data with row storage, all the yellow boxes are the data that you are storing. You need to access the entire row before you can go to a particular column. Wasted I.O. means higher performance latencies for you. Columnar storage allows you to access your data for that particular column from that particular block alone. You only scan the blocks that are relevant for the query. You don't scan everything. Compression. Compression reduces your I.O. as well, the I.O. overhead. If you look at the uh, these encode strings at the end of the column definitions, they are basically saying what kind of encoding or what kind of compression is Redshift doing for that column. It reduces storage requirements and reduces the I.O. as well. Each of the columns grow and shrink independently. They don't have to depend on the other column. So you can say, I'll start with uh, 
run length encoding on it, and then move to Z STD or LZO, and we will still do that for you, because each of these columns can compress individually. The third important thing for I.O. detection is zone maps. It, zone maps are in-memory block metadata. They contain per block minimum and maximum values. So each of these LO, sorry, each of these LO boxes are blocks, and in each of those blocks we store the minimum and maximum value for that particular block. So when a query runs through the blocks, it can skip blocks which may not have the data that it is interested in, which reduces unnecessary I/O for you. It's very important that you define your table for encoding. You define sort keys for your table, which is going to improve performance. Because once your data is sorted, your zone maps work far better. Slice. A slice is a virtual compute node. Think of it as a virtual compute node. Each node has two 16 or 32 slices, depending on the instance type that you choose for that node. So if you have a two-node cluster of a DC1 large, you will have four slices on it, two per node. A slice is where your data is stored. The slice only processes its own data. It doesn't borrow data from another slice to process it. Data distribution, very important, as important as sort keys. We have three ways of distributing data in Redshift. Redshift is a massively parallel processing system. So we need to distribute the data across the cluster. So we can distribute the data using keys, where you define a key that you want to distribute the data across. Or you can distribute the data into all the slices in the cluster. Or ask us to evenly distribute the data across the nodes for you. On the key side of things, you need to be ensured that your data is evenly distributed, your key is, even, is able to evenly distribute the data. If you have lopsided distribution, you will see that your cluster doesn't perform optimally. Disks. Each node contains ephemeral disks. We have 2.5 to 3x the capacity that we advertise on the nodes. So when we say that the node capacity is 2 terabytes, we have close to 6 terabytes that we use internally. So what do we use it for? We use it for storing data from remote nodes. So each of these nodes are ephemeral storage. So we take the data from that node, a part of the data from that node, and store it, duplicate it in another node as well. So we have local data storage accessed by the local compute nodes, and remote data storage accessed by the remote compute nodes. We have internal views that exposes this for you. Uh, you can actually look at those views to understand how much of the data of the remote node is stored in your local compute nodes. Blocks are immutable 1MB blocks that we use in Redshift. All data is stored on the block. The block has metadata information on it, on the zone map information. It it also stores information regarding MVCC data. So your immutable blocks are always formatted when you do an update. We don't go and change a record inside a block. So your block has to be formatted. A new block has to be picked up when an update is done. So you need to be careful about doing many updates on Redshift because you need to do a vacuum or a deep copy right after an update if it spans many rows, because you'll have ghost rows inside the blocks. A full block may contain anywhere between 16 and 8.4 million values. So if I'm able to extract one single block of data into memory, I should be able to read a max of 8.4 million values for that table. Columns. Logical structures accessible through SQL. The properties of a column include the distribution keys, sort keys, and compression algorithm that's being used. Columns shrink and grow independently. They don't, you don't need to have, you, you may have a run length encoding on a column, and these columns may have a different encoding to a, another column, or within the data itself, one column may show run length encoding for 100 rows, and then the next 100 rows may not have run length encoding on them. 
The system columns, there are three system columns per table, per slice for MVCC. So a few of the new and the upcoming features on Redshift. How many of you heard about Spectrum? Spectrum. Uh, anybody attended the earlier talk of Adrian? Adrian was mentioning that S3 is where you keep all your data. And that is the philosophy that Amazon is going with. S3 is your data lake. You put all your data in S3. And then query the data using your Redshift cluster, query the data using Athena, query the data using EMR. Spectrum allows you to query your data stored in S3 without having to load the data into the Redshift cluster. It is fully SQL supported, ANSI SQL compliant. It pushes the SQL predicates into the spectrum layer so that your cluster is not overburdened with that work. So it doesn't have to go and pull like a terabyte of data in and apply predicates to it. It can push the predicates into the spectrum cluster, do the pre predicate processing there, and only get the amount of data that is needed for your query. You can join your Redshift tables with your spectrum tables, which are external tables which effectively means I can start doing rollout from Redshift for data that is not accessed so frequently and kept inside S3. I can have multiple Redshift clusters going and hitting the data on uh, Spectrum, on S3, through the Spectrum clusters. That means that I increase the concurrency for my Redshift cluster. Because instead of going with 15 concurrency, I can now say, I can have two Redshift clusters looking at the data, and I have 30 people who can run queries against it. So the architecture remains the same. We still have a leader node and a few compute nodes out there. So whenever you submit a query which involves data from an external store like S3, Redshift pushes the data to the spectrum nodes out there. They scale out based on the number of nodes that you have on your Redshift cluster. They push the predicates as well down to the Spectrum nodes. The Spectrum nodes gathers the data from S3. Remember, it doesn't load the data into the Redshift cluster. Your cluster still remains as a small, agile cluster. It loads the data into the, it, it looks at the data on S3, doesn't load the data into Redshift, processes the data, applies the predicates, and gives the results back to your compute nodes. Your compute nodes can further do processing on it by joining the data to existing tables on the Redshift cluster and providing you the results. The data catalog for Spectrum is run from Apache Hive Metastore. If you're using Apache Hive Metastore, you can reuse the Hive Metastore. If you are using Glue, Glue integrates with Redshift Spectrum as well. There's a paradigm shift enabled by Redshift Spectrum. Earlier, customers used to say, I will only be able to analyze or visualize a, a small subset of data because my data warehouse cannot handle all the data in it. With Spectrum, you can put all your data in S3 and query the data through your Redshift cluster using proper SQL statements. A few of the recently released features on Redshift. I've not taken everything here. Performance enhancements. We have increased our vacuum speeds 10x faster now. Our snapshot and restores are 2x faster. Our queries are up to 5x faster. We introduced a new service called Query Monitoring Rules on Redshift recently. Query Monitoring Rules look at your queries. They monitor your queries, in-flight queries and then say, is this query taking too much memory? Is it querying, taking too much CPU? Is it returning more rows than needed? And it allows you to kill the query. Which basically means your data scientists cannot do runaway queries on the Redshift cluster. So they can go and run a query, pull data out, but they have to be conscious of the fact that other people are using the Redshift cluster as well. You define the rules, we will execute the rules behind the scenes for you. We have enhanced VPC routing, so we support the S3 buckets as a VPC endpoint today. So you can put access keys, access policies around those S3 buckets, 
and restrict who can of offload data from Redshift into the buckets or onload data from, Redshift, from the S3 buckets into Redshift. IAM authentication. We, we pre-announced this last reInvent. We had uh, a few customers do private beta with us. Uh, we had partners come in and uh, help us develop the, the JDBC drivers for it. So it uses a custom JDBC ODBC driver that we provide today for you. This custom JDBC ODBC driver can actually talk to your AD federated logins and create appropriate temporary logins within Redshift for you to access the data. If you are a Redshift user using Tableau desktop, Tableau have released their own uh, connector for this as well, and it works with Tableau. It's very easy to set up. Uh, we released it on GA uh, two weeks back. Uh, it is, if you are using any of the AD federation like Okta, ADFS, or Ping Federate, it's very easy for you to set it up and uh, start using Redshift on your AD authenticated mode. If you're interested in doing this, please reach out to your account team. We are more than happy to uh, come and explain the whole thing, how it works, and help you configure it for you as well. Lots of things are coming. Uh, these are the top requested feature at this time. Automatic and incremental vacuum. Today, a lot of customers spend time doing vacuums. Their vacuum is their biggest bottleneck on an ETL process. Because they update, because they delete records from the uh, database, they want to do vacuum. They want to also sort the data that is being inserted into the Redshift cluster. They do vacuums, and the vacuums take a lot of time. When they do continuous ETL, where they don't have a predefined window, but they continuously keep doing ETL, the vacuum process starts eating into their ETL times, and which affects their business users. We are, we are working on an automatic and incremental approach to vacuum, where we will vacuum it for you. You don't have to do anything. Leave it with us, and we will take care of it. This is very similar to the PostgreSQL auto vacuum feature. Uh, PostgreSQL doesn't have an incremental vacuum. Incremental vacuum is this, this is something that we are developing within Redshift. Short query bias. We can look at queries and say, hey, this query may run faster than a, than a query that is ahead of the queue, and we may throw that, queue, that query into the top of the queue. Uh, we keep monitoring the queries. We know the execution plans of these queries. We know how much time each of these queries took, and we would be able to take these queries and put them up into the queue so that they execute faster and your users don't have to wait for those queries. Uh, 